Okay, so welcome back. Um, welcome back. So I wanted to start with a sort of quick, um, with a quick lightning review of stuff that we did last time. So, so we start with the modular space of uh, holomorphic vector bundles. So we fix the degree and the rank for good. And we, I said we always work over a compact Riemann surface C. Um, so one approach to it is to say, well, the difference between the complex and the holomorphic vector bundle is one of these del bar operators. And um, so let's say A, up, you know, upper index del bar, uh, let that be the space of these del bar operators. So that's some infinite dimensional space. But um, if you take the difference between two del bar operators and you look at the definition, then one of the funky terms cancels and you see that can you reset the symmetry? Yes, here. Um, and you see that um, the um, the difference between two of them is just one of those zero one forms that are, uh, in the endomorphisms. And so, um, so this the space is an affine space modeled on this infinite dimensional you know complex vector space, and it has an action of the complex gauge group of sections of uh, you know just invertible endomorphisms. So you are tempted to take this naive quotient, um, but that is of course badly behaved. So we need to take a closer look. And as always, there are sort of in the scalar language or in the scalar world, there are sort of two things you can either do sort of the algebraic or complex geometric GIT quotient, or you take the symplectic quotient. And for the symplectic quotient, you need to change gears a little bit. So pick a Hermitian metric H once and for good um, to like do this entire quotient business and call a uh, upper index h the h unitary connections on now this Hermitian vector bundle. Just like before, there's some infinite dimensional vector space. Now it's not a complex vector space, but it's only as like a real structure. And it's uh, it's um, it's modeled on just one forms valued in sort of unitary endomorphisms. And uh, in fact, there's an isomorphism as sort of real um, affine spaces between the two of them where um, if you have a unitary connection, you just take a zero one part, that is a, that is a del bar operator and vice versa to every del bar operator, there's a unique um, H unitary connection that's compatible with the complex structure and that is called the churn connection. Um, and again, compatible with the complex structure basically just means that it's zero one part is the del bar operator you started off with. So, so this is sort of a back and forth and, and the, action of the real gauge group now, which is again sections of, of unitary endomorphisms on this space, admits a moment map. I wrote it out for you here one more time, the moment map. One, if you give me a connection, the moment map is negative the curvature of this connection minus some constant times one omega, uh, or like, you know, uh, omega c, the, the, the um, uh, volume form on the Riemann surface. And, and we said that the zero level set of this thing is what's called Einstein connections. So in the case that the degree of the vector bundle is zero, d equals zero, this entire thing would just be saying that you have a flat connection. But of course, if you have um, a, not, a, a vector bundle of non-zero degree, then it cannot admit a flat connection by um, sort of the churn rail formula for uh, computing the degree that I discussed last time. So this is basically as flat as you can hope for. Well, in any case, so now you have two ways to take a quotient. You can take this GIT quotient here, um, where I haven't spelled out the uh, stability uh, conditions again, but you call, you define the slope of a vector bundle to be the, uh, the quotient of the degree and the rank. And you say a vector bundle is stable um, if the, the slope is strictly decreasing as you pass to uh, proper sub bundles. So this is this GT quotient on the left. You can take the symplectic quotient here. By definition, symplectic quotient means you take a level set of the um, moment map of some regular value, which zero is, and then you model by the symplectic or like by the by the action of the real gauge group. And so you have these two quotients, and they are actually the same. And this is a consequence of this famous theorem by Narasimhan and Seshadri. And since one of them is sort of complex manifold and one is like more naturally interpreted as something symplectic you could hope that it's something Keller and it indeed is and and it's a Keller manifold if you have stable vector if you if you, uh, if you restrict your attention to the stable locus it's a Keller manifold uh, on the polystable or semi-stable locus it's not necessarily smooth but it's still Keller like on its smooth locus 
and the dimension you can compute, it's g minus one times k squared plus one. So in particular, it doesn't depend on the uh, on the degree of the bundle. Okay, let's go to page two. So the the, uh, the reason why I sort of um, went through all of this hustle, even though the course is called Higgs bundles, is because the construction for Higgs bundles is pretty much similar, and I hope that at least some people may have seen the construction for vector bundles before. So uh, let's again restrict our attention to Higgs bundles of degree d for the structure group G equals GLKC. So a GLKC Higgs bundle is a pair that consists of a holomorphic vector bundle of rank k, as well as a section of its endomorphism bundle twisted by the canonical bundle, so the uh, cotangent bundle. So what that means is that locally, if you pick any sort of local coordinate, these Higgs bundles look like um, some matrix, some holomorphic holomorphically varying matrix um, times dz. Um, so if you start off with already a stable vector bundle, then the, the, this, this, uh, this pair E and phi just lies inside of the cotangent bundle or to the moduli space of stable vector bundles. And, and this is sort of our guiding principle to see how we could construct this moduli space. So if we say, okay, the cotangent bundle to this space is of course the space itself is the quotient. So it's the cotangent bundle to this quotient. Um, this is just a GIT quotient here, right? This is not the symplectic quotient. So um, by sort of standard um, standard theory of get a bit more standard, by sort of standard theory of um, symplectic quotients, taking the cotangent bundle of a quotient should be the same as taking the symplectic quotient of the cotangent bundle. So this is what's happening here, except that this is sort of the holomorphic symplectic analog of that. So in order to make sense of this symplectic quotient, we need to find now again a moment map, and that should be complex valued. And indeed there is one, and I call it M1, and it, it is just a multiple basically of the L-bar feed. So the inverse image of zero is again just saying that uh, the inverse image is saying that um, uh, image image of zero or the level set of zero is the locus where phi is holomorphic section. Okay, so there's uh, another approach which in a, in a way is better or more enlightening, which is a hyperkähler quotient. Um, so start with again pick a unitary connection H, and let A H be um, pairs D, but D is just a unitary connection on this, so like the same thing as before. And phi is a one form in, uh, you know, valued in this, uh, in the Lie algebra of unitary transformations. And as you can see, this is just an affine space model on omega one plus omega one, uh, each time valued again in the Lie algebra of unitary endomorphisms. Um, another little bit of notation, I, A1 upper C, uh, is what I will call T star, or like the cotangent bundle to the space A, A del bar. And the um, isomorphism from A del bar to A upper upper index sort of small h extends to an isomorphism between the cotangent bundle on this side and the sort of doubled space on the other side, which should not be su surprising to you. I mean, these are just affine spaces. So like um, identifying their like tangent and cotangent spaces while they already have a metric should not be that hard. And indeed, I wrote down for you one way in which you can go. So if you start with a Higgs pair like this, so a complex structure and a Higgs field, then you can again construct the churn connection. That's just the, the thing that we've already done in, in the modular space of bundles picture. And you can construct this field phi. It's just uh, phi minus phi dagger. And again, just be aware that the space A upper H depends already on the choice of permission metric H I made. And so you should not be surprised that all of this also depends on it. In fact, of course, the churn connection depends on it because I haven't really told you what this is. This depends on the churn connection. And this little innocently looking dagger up here is also the dagger with respect to this emission metric. Okay, so in this space now, we have an action of the real gauge group G, and this one has moment maps. So one moment map is just uh, the sort of moment map that we've already discovered on the left-hand side here. It's M1, which I can, which is a complex moment map, so I can sort of, uh, I can write it in terms of its real and imaginary part, and that those things are called mu2 and mu3. 
I also have the analog of the moment map from the modular space of bundles picture. Um, so if you forget about this term here for a moment, then it's exactly the moment map I had before. And this one here in the middle is just the correction term that makes up for the fact that I've doubled stuff. Um, so I have these three moment maps and they are in fact make up hyperkähler moment map. And so I can take a hyperkähler quotient, which is like denoted um, some people at least by sort of these four slashes because it cuts the dimension of the space by four times the dimension of the group that I cut out by. And the definition is that I take the level set of this, of like I intersect the three level sets with respect to the three moment maps. Those intersect transversely. That's what it means to be a hyperkähler moment map. And after I do that, I am mod out by the action of G. And that is our definition of the space M um, upper S K D C. And um, since it's a hyperkähler quotient, you would hope that it's hyperkähler, which indeed it is, at least in the, again, the stable locus. And the dimension is exactly twice the dimension of the modular space of bundles, which uh, also shouldn't surprise you because we started off hoping that it would be something similar to the cotension bundle. Okay, so all of this is stuff that we did last time. Um, right, so of course, if I want to, oh, there's one more. So I'm going to page three now. So I took a hyperkähler quotient, which means um, I take a quotient of a hyperkähler space by you know, some nice action. So in order for this to make sense, of course, the, the, the sort of big space, this big affine space has to be hyperkähler. I haven't discussed that so far yet. So let me dive like roughly into it. So um, the A upper H was symplectic. Um, since this A upper, uh, the A sort of upper, small h was symplectic, sorry. So this A upper capital H is just double to that space. So it has a natural symplectic structure, which is just um, the symplectic structures of each of the individual pieces. So this is, this, this is precisely what this omega one is. Um, so you can see you're basically doing the same thing twice there. Um, the omega two and omega three come from the fact that the A upper H was Keller and I take, um, it's cotension bundle, so it has a complex valued um, symplectic form. And if I just look at the two individual pieces, I get uh, like at the, at the real and the imaginary part of it, I get an omega two and an omega three. So, so so far so good. So this is where these formulas come from. Now, if you have th these three omegas, um, then on the first day I said if they have a certain compatibility condition, then you can reconstruct the metric format. And this is exactly what you can check, and you will find that it has a metric that has also a similar shape. So all of these three formulas are, give me two pairs of one forms. Um, I will compute a number for you. So what do I do? I integrate over the surface, since the wedge of two one forms is a two form, that's great. And since they're all Lie algebra valued in some way or another, um, I need to take traces though first. So, so the rough shape of them is, is always the same, um, of all of these four formulas. And once you know the metric and the three symplectic forms, you can just reconstruct the um, complex structures. And uh, I wrote out the formulas for you down here. So um, if, if you're like skeptical of any of this, for example, for the um, for the uh, for these almost complex structures, you can check just like right by hand that first of all they square to like negative the identity. This you basically figure out by staring at it and realizing that um, on the Riemann metric you have a positive definite um, metric, so the Hodge star on one form squares to negative one. So this sort of explains that sort of, for example, I one just squares to negative identity. Um, and the other thing you can check is that sort of they obey these um, quaternionic relations. So for example, I one, I two is I three, and so forth. So um, that's like you know, if you're really skeptical or bored, then that's lots of like algebra things you can play around with. But I just wanted to like write down these formulas because first of all, we will like Need, use them a little bit now but second of all is because like none of this is like complete like utter you know abstract nonsense like there's some very concrete things floating around in particular before you take the quotient because it's just done some vector spaces and they're infinite dimensional sure but it's like if you can't find formulas nicely on literally like affine spaces then then uh, you might be in trouble okay so this is where we this is where we're taking off so i've 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 um I've told you that um, there's a hyperkähler quotient, and I've shown you that in a specific, almost complex structure, namely I1, 
it looks like the modular space of Higgs bundles. Uh, and we haven't really discussed these stability conditions yet. So a natural question should be. So yeah, let me get started writing. So in the complex structure I1, we have that, um, we have that uh, this hyperkähler quotient is roughly um, the same as taking this A1C mod out by GC in a symplectic fashion. And this is as, uh, as holomorphic symplectic manifolds, right? So spaces, I should say, maybe. Um, so on the right, I literally take a holomorphic symplectic quotient, but every hyperkähler manifold is holomorphic symplectic in a CP1 worth of way. So I need to tell you like which way and the way I, I choose is the one that comes from I1. And the, the, the sort of the subscript should be in a certain fashion, like coherent. So like the I1 there is, is, um, has to do, for example, with the fact that I have an A1 like right here. Okay, so, so the question is, what happens about the other complex structures? So in every complex structure now, we've constructed a certain holomorphic symplectic space, but of course the obvious question should be, is this some moduli space in some way? Is it, does, it, does the space have any meaning? Um, so let's, let's maybe take a look at I2 first. I2, um, I, wrote it to you, I wrote it to you on the left, right? It takes A and phi, uh, infinitesimal uh, change, changes of a and phi into negative phi dot a dot. So, so if you take the combination a dot plus i phi dot, that um, becomes um, well, a dot becomes negative phi dot, and uh, the other thing becomes this. So, if you just rearrange it ever so slightly, it looks exactly like this, right? So the uh, complex structure I2 acts on this sort of combination by just multiplying it by I. So that means that A dot plus I phi dot is, is a holomorphic, um, it's a holomorphic uh, you know, connection. So, so let's give this thing a name. Let's call this thing Nabla2. So we let um, A2C be the space of a complex connections on this Hermitian vector bundle EH. Of course, complex connections has nothing to do with the Hermitian structure, but the Hermitian structure is already floating around, so we may as well take it along for the right. Um, and we can always decompose this into two pieces um, where um, the D is unitary, and the other one is just a uh, self adjoint. Um, okay, so here again we have the action of uh, of a gauge group, and it acts in the usual way. And Nabla two gets mapped to. I mean, it's a connection. So does the gauge group act? It always acts the same way. It acts like a, the gauge group acts on connections. Okay, so for this action. We again have a, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, so this should be the, this is wrong on my notes. So this should be the complexified gauge group, right? Um, I, have, I have complex connections. I don't need to impose any reality condition because a complex connection has nothing to do with the emission metric. So it's an action by the complexified gauge group. Um, so this thing has moment maps. Um, and as it happens, in since I'm a complex structure I2 and I already know these three real moment maps, and I can make the combination. Um, I need to make a complex combi uh, I need to make a complex moment map. And what I should do is I should take mu three plus i mu one. So you can check that this is the right thing to do by just sort of abstract hyperkähler nonsense. Um, and um, 
And if I spell this out, this is d phi plus i <clears throat> minus f d plus phi which phi plus uh, sorry minus two pi i uh, d over k one times omega c. So what's a good way to interpret um, the inverse image of zero here? Um, if you rearrange the entire thing, it's you can write it as follows: i d phi um, plus f d minus phi, which phi is uh, two pi i d over k one times omega c. Um, in other words, you can write it as complex connections whose curvature is two pi i d over k one times symplectic form, right? Um, so Nabla two again, for governor Nabla two, uh, you can decompose it and write this d plus i phi. And then you will realize that um, if you compute its, its connection two form, then you get exactly this, uh, this ship bank here on the left. Okay, so that's great. Um, so this means that the sort of level set of zero here is again just a complex now, complex Einstein connections. And if the word Einstein connection makes you feel uncomfortable, then just as always think of the case where D is equal to zero, and then we're talking about flat connections. Um, So in the structure I2, and again, I'm not a uh, modulo problems of stability. We have that this hypercalar quotient gives us a certain holomorphic symplectic space and as holomorphic symplectic manifolds, it is just equivalence classes of complex Einstein connections. So, um, Okay, so that's I2. Now for I3, you can do the same thing. So I'll just sort of uh, give it to you as an exercise. So uh, the holomorphic combination you want to take is D plus um, I star phi. Uh, check that this is holomorphic. Check that the right thing to do for the moment map is again, take the, 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 the two other real mode maps so if this subscript here is three then you want to take one and two and um, put them in the right order so it should be e1 plus i mu2 and that deteriorates my handwriting um, um, this is a complex mode map and uh, and check that uh, the inverse image of zero is uh, maybe let me write it again this way. So a connection sits inside of the level set of zero uh, uh, if and only if it is a complex Einstein connection. And you can check more generally. Um, that for any zeta in C star, you can take this combination, nabla zeta, it's zeta inverse phi plus d plus zeta phi dagger. Um, again, this is with respect to the uh, emission connection, is an Einstein connection, a complex Einstein connection. Okay, so um, uh, so how do you check that? Um, the, the check of this is basically, um, like the proof of this sort of general Einstein-ness uh, comes from the Hitchin equations. 
So the Hitchin equations, um, are, I didn't write them again today, but I wrote them last time. They're the, sort of the level set of the hyperkähler quotient. So since we're looking at different complex structures here, you, you might expect that you also need a little bit more than uh, information in just a single level set, and that's indeed the case. Uh, but the level set of this hyperkähler quotient will tell you precisely that um, all of these connections are Einstein, or once again, in the case that the degree of the bundle is zero, it means that these connections are flat. Um, and so what we do have is we have this single space modeled by uh, a hyperkähler quotient by an, a, this real gauge group can be identified with the space, the modular space or like the Kulens classes of Einstein connections um, in a, a whole different ways. A whole sort of isomorphic symplectic. Again, man manifolds, I should put a little bit in parentheses because we haven't really talked about stability conditions yet. But on that smooth locus, um, I can identify these two spaces as isomorphic symplectic spaces. And that's kind of funky because, of course, there's no reason to believe that all of these spaces on the right hand side look the same. So I have a single space that I can identify with sort of a moduli space of Einstein connections and a whole C star worth of ways. Uh, and in fact, in a family as we will get to. Um, so in order to make this like identification really precise, we need to um, we need to look at stability conditions and once again though. So that leads me to page five. Um, so a Higgs bundle oops, E or phi is called um, stable or semi-stable. So yeah, let me do this with the color again. stable if for any for all phi invariant sub bundles um, let's call them f so that means that um, if i restrict my attention if i restrict my higgs field um, to phi it uh, sorry if i restrict my higgs field phi to f uh, and again, an F that can't be quite right because it's not an endomorphism, it's twisted by KC. So what I should hope is that it lands in F tensor KC. Um, uh, we have that the slope of F is smaller than the slope of E for stability or less than or equal for semi-stability. So the sort of condition itself is literally exactly the same, it's just for bundles. Um, the only difference is that I don't necessarily need to look at all holomorphic subbundles. The only one, the, the stability conditions are a little bit relaxed because um, I could have potentially have a holomorphic subbundle of, of larger slope, which is not phi invariant. So I could potentially um, have a you know, stable Higgs bundle whose underlying vector bundle is not stable. And in fact, we will see that in just a second. So this is what semi stability and stability is again. And, uh, uh, and the third one uh, is again, um, poly stability. Uh, and poly stable ones are the one that are direct sums. of stable Higgs bundles and all of all of them have the same slope all of which have the same slope so um so as as in the case with bundles stability implies polystability 
implies semi-stability. And in the case that uh, K and D are co-prime, um, this entire hierarchy just collapses and stability becomes the same as semi-stability. So let's uh, look at a couple of examples. So if you have a stable vector bundle, then if you just put the zero Higgs field on there, so again, the Higgs field is a section of some vector bundle, so I can just take the zero section. Um, that's still stable, right? Because, well, every holomorphic subbundle is invariant if you just have the zero section. So the stability condition is literally the same on the left and on the right. So in fact, it's not only that a stable vector for a stable vector bundle, I can endow it with a zero Higgs field and get a zero Higgs, uh, get a stable Higgs bundle. But if I ever have a stable Higgs bundle with the zero Higgs field, then the underlying vector bundle has already been stable. So they, these two things are, are the same. So what, what this tells you in particular is that inside of the modular space of Higgs bundles, we have we have the modular space of vector bundles sitting inside of there. And they meet exactly the the Higgs field, the Higgs bundles with zero Higgs field. Second thing you can do is uh, we can just take a holomorphic line bundle. Um, if your phi in this case should just be any um, holomorphic one form, um, and then you can check that this pair L phi is a stable Higgs bundle. Again, stability conditions are stored, like these stability conditions are always a little bit boring for line bundles because a proper sub bundle of a line bundle is just like, it can't exist, right? It can't be the bundle itself and it can't be zero and there's nothing in between for like dimension reasons. So whatever fee you pick, this is going to be a stable Higgs bundle. Um, so maybe let's look at uh, rank two. So let's start again with a line bundle. Um, let E B L tensor K C direct sum with L. So let me just like note right here, this is obviously not a stable vector bundle. Right? Um, best I can hope for here is that it's semi-stable. It's like L tensor KC. If KC has degree zero, this could be polystable. But otherwise, one of these two lines uh, will have a larger slope than the other, and in particular will have a larger slope than E. Um, so um, I start with this thing, but nonetheless, I can um, try to write down Higgs field. So let's, let's, let's look at the type decomposition of this thing. So <clears throat> the, the top left component, right, will go from the top left component of this guy will go from L tensor KC to L, uh, sorry, from L tensor KC to itself, tensor KC. So it will have to be something in KC. The bottom left component will go from L tensor KC to L, and then it's twisted by KC. So it goes from the line bundle to itself. So it should be a section of the trivial bundle. Um, bottom right is for the same reason as the top left uh, diagonal. So it goes from a bundle to itself, but then tends of KC. And the top right will go from L, to L tensor KC, tensor KC. So it should be a section of KC squared. So, um, so what we should do is we should write phi as a matrix where we just put perhaps a one here, holomorphic one form here, and a quadratic differential there. So phi one is a section, or phi i is a section of uh, KC to the ith power. Okay, so so now you can ask, okay, is this pair E phi stable? And the answer is yes, it's actually stable for any choice of phi, which is kind of perhaps a little bit surprising. Phi is stable. Any 
P1, P2. Um, the only condition, of course, you need to impose here is that um, the the um, the uh, genus of the Riemann surface that you start off with is at least two, um, because otherwise it, uh, the canonical bundle or um, its tensor power strong, you can have sections that will only be the zero sections. You can convince yourself that those will actually not be enough to make a um, to make a stable Higgs bundle out of it. All right. Um, excellent. So this third example is important enough to actually um, deserve a name. It is called the Hitchin section for reasons that will become um, more obvious later. Uh, this is called the Hitchin section. for um, GL2. Um, and um, it, I mean, it, it constitutes an entire like subspace. It's not just a single point, right? Different points of different choices for P1 and P2 may potentially be different equivalence classes of X bundles. So uh, you can convince yourself um, that uh, so like I said, this is stable. So it lies inside of um, the modular space of stable Higgs bundles. For some degree, the degree you can compute, it depends on the, dimen uh, on the degree of L as well as the degree of KC, whatever it is. But as I said, it's it, the underlying vector bundle, is not a stable vector bundle. So this lies in the complement of, whoops, lies inside the complement of, whoops. Third time, everything will be good. It lies inside the complement of the cotension bundle of stable vector bundles. And, uh, and this is sort of what, um, this is sort of the enlightening fact that like these stability conditions brought upon us. There is uh, this, this modular space of Higgs bundles. First and foremost, it contains the um, cotension bundle to stable vector bundles, but it contains a little bit more. Um, and this Hitchin section is sort of a prime example of that. Okay, so the next thing we should do, again, in light of how we um, how we uh, pursued um, our, you know, how our path went when we talked about uh, vector bundles, is we should uh, double check that the two different quotients we take are compatible. Um, so in the in the example before, that was sort of the content of this theorem by Narasimha and Seshadri. And now we should hope that there's some someone smart has figured out something similar. And luckily that is indeed the case. Let's go to page six. So before I go there, I need to do one more definition. So a complex connection D um, on E is called reductive. If um, for every D invariant sub bundle um, F in E, uh, there exists um, there exists a complement. So there exists a D invariant sub bundle. F prime in E such that E is a direct sum of these two pieces. Um, so like two quick remarks. So we've already talked about irreducible, um, already talked about irreducible connections before. So these reductive connections you can see should correspond to polystable, um, just like every um, 
in what we've discussed already, irreducible should have something to do with stable stuff. Um, but then you should ask me, wait, but why did we talk about irreducible connections already? Oh, we haven't talked about reductive connections. We never mentioned these. We should have talked about them already when we talked about just the modular space of final set, like unitary connections. And the answer is that for uni, this is like something that's sort of peculiar to complex, and maybe I don't even write this down. This is something peculiar to complex connections because if I have a unitary connection, I, since I have, you know, a metric, I can always just take the author complement. So this sort of notion of reductiveness is sort of redundant, like every connection is re like reductive because whenever I have a, a D invariant sub bundle, I just take its author complement with respect to the unitary, with respect to the metric, and, and that's it. So, so this is only something interesting for complex connections. <clears throat> Okay, so so now we're in shape to uh, uh, so to sort of prove the sort of analogous or like not proof. I can tell you about the analogous theorem of analog uh, anal analog whatever of uh, the Nara Simhan Tishadri theorem for Higgs bundles. So it has two parts since, so we took this hyperkela quotient, identified it with, in one complex structure with the um, modular space of Higgs bundles, in another complex structure or like in a whole C star of other complex structures with the modular space of, you know, Einstein or flat connections. So, so we have two different identifications. So this theorem also has sort of two different components. It has the, it has the, it has the part where I'm, I, I, I make, you know, I, I, I make this identification precise. It has the part where I say that these two quotients are the same for Higgs bundles, and then I'm, I'm, I have the part of the theorem where I say these quotients are the same for flat bundles for Einstein connections. Okay, so first part is, um, let me give a bit more space here. So if I have um, a pair D phi, inside of the um, semi-stable or stable locus, um, sorry, polystable or stable locus, um, then the, um, let me just write it and then I say it. Okay, so on the left-hand side of this equality, I have two uh, two different spaces. Either it has this upper script S or not. The upper script S means I have irreducible connections, and the uh, without the S, I only look at reductive connections. So I start with either an irreducible or a reductive, um, you know, pair D phi inside of this moduli space. And the claim is that um, then I can cook up this triple. Uh, well, the E is already given to me. The del bar D is just the zero one part of D, and this like small phi I just uh, construct from the large phi in the usual way. And depending on whether the connection was reductive or irreducible, this Higgs bundle this will be a Higgs bundle and will be either stable or polystable. So again, irreducible will lead to stable, reductive will lead to polystable, and vice versa. So from this Higgs bundle, I can construct. Um, I can construct this pair D phi in, in the way I described before. And starting with a polystable Higgs bundle will give me a reductive connection. Um, starting with a stable Higgs bundle will give me something uh, irreducible. Um, so so, that, so this, uh, I won't prove this, but this is, um, this is due to Hitchin. In the case that k is equal to two, and then it's due to Simpson, out of Simpson, in the case that k is larger than two, and then there's sort of analogous statements for the case where um, I have a different group, so like the group is not GLKC, but all of this is figured out by now. And here's the, the sort of the second theorem, the analogous theorem for the connections. So again, I start with a pair.
um, on the left. And from there, I can construct a I can construct this connection that I wrote before. So I take zeta inverse phi plus d plus zeta phi dagger, and this is uh, a either a reductive or an irreducible. Um, complex Einstein connection. Okay, so um, so also the proof here I won't give. So all of these proofs, um, so this is all happened sort of when Higgs bonds were first invented. So this all goes back to like the late 80s, early 90s. So the proof of K equals two is due to Simon Donaldson. Um, and then the general case is, is uh, was done by Corlett. Um, yeah, so so the fascinating thing here now though is that um, it's sort of a corollary. It's not even a corollary, it's like a rewriting of the theorem, but I think it may deserve, um, may deserve uh, an extra little slide here. It's that, um, Writing is really not the best today. There is a homeomorphism um, from sort of the modular space of Higgs bundles. So this is the space I called A1C mod out by GC to you know any of the zetas GC which we uh, call M de Ram. Also, again, if I start on the left and I start with either polystable or a stable Higgs bundle, then I can find uh, I can find a Hermitian connect uh, Hermitian metric called the harmonic metric, so that this pair d phi is a harmonic pair, so it solves these um, Hitchin equations. And once I have this pair. I can go to my point two and construct a connection from there, and that connection will be reductive or irreducible, depending on whether I started with a stable or, or a polystable Higgs bundle. And the inverse direction should go exactly the same way, right? If I start with either reductive or irreducible complex Einstein connection, then I can find this pair D phi, which is a harmonic pair with respect to some harmonic metric, and and from that pair, and I can then construct the Higgs bundle. So all of this seems very, very easy, but remember that no one, when someone has, gives you like, you know, a stable or polystable Higgs bundle, no one tells you what the, what the, um, what this metric is, this harmonic metric. So, so you need to solve some really, really difficult um, PDE. So this is a, this is a pretty hard theorem. And this theorem goes by the name uh, non abelian Hodge theorem. Okay, maybe let me pause for like one second in case anyone has a question. Oh, Sebastian, I have a question. Um, right. Uh, so did you talk much about like this harmonic metric? Uh, cause I, I kind of missed some of today and the end of yesterday. Uh, no, I haven't really talked much about it. Oh, okay. Uh, my question might be pretty long, so I, I might put it to the end. Uh, wait, uh, okay, sure. Um, so so um so I want to talk about 
um, another way of sort of phrasing this theorem, um, and that involves uh, the notion of a twister space for a hyperkata manifold. So, in an ideal world, I would have covered that in the first lecture, but I ran out of time, so I will have to do that now. So, if you have um, some hyperkata manifold, um, you can construct a space Z, which is um, as a sort of smooth manifold, it's just X cross S2, but we want to turn this into a complex manifold. So, or at least almost complex manifold with an almost complex structure. So, the almost complex structure at a point X and Zeta. So S2, of course, by the normalization theorem, has a unique complex structure, which makes it CP1. And um, the almost complex structure at a point X Zeta is the Zeta complex structure of this hyperkähler space. So it has a it has a whole CP1 of complex structures. So for this first part, it's just that. And then the second part, it's just the standard complex structure on, on P1. Okay, so this is an almost complex structure, and you can check um, that this is integrable. So this space Z is actually an honest complex manifold. Um, it does have a couple of properties. Um, so the um, projection onto the second factor is a holomorphic map. Um, I mean, that shouldn't really surprise you. I mean, it's just forgetting about the first piece. It's a direct composition, so that should probably be fine. Um, this uh, space Z has um, a fiber-wise, whoops, um, holomorphic symplectic structure. Um, so let's call this capital Omega. It's a two zero form um, on C sort of hyperwise tensored with, uh, sorry, tensored with the pullback along P of the bundle O2. So, so what's this piece here? This is um, the um, exterior power of um, the, uh, I take one zero homes on Z in the vertical direction and I take its dual. Okay, so the picture you should have is, is um, I, have, I have my whole space, you know, Z sitting over CP1. So CP1 is just, you know, as everyone knows, it's sphere. Over every point, I have um, I have the space um, x in the complex structure I zeta. Um, and um, and if I if I fix a single zeta, then in this fiber I have a holomorphic symplectic structure. And why is that not crazy? Because that fiber is just the space um, X looked at in the complex structure I zeta. And we know that if you take hyperkähler manifold and restrict your attention to one, um, to one um, uh, complex structure, then that becomes a holomorphic symplectic manifold with respect to that complex structure. And this is all this is saying. Um, This space Z uh, carries a real structure. So a real structure is, uh, is an anti-holomorphic involution. Uh, what do I call it, rho? Z to Z. Um, and it uh, covers the 
it covers the antipodal map on CP1. So, yeah, if you pull back this bundle along the antipodal map, that gives you an involution of the total space, and, and that involution is in fact a real structure. So, uh, just like the antipodal map squares to one, so will this square to one, but moreover, it's also antipodomorphic. Um, and what happens if you uh, try to pull back this fiberwise almost complex, uh, sorry, fiberwise holomorphic symplectic structure? Then you just get its complex conjugate. Uh, and again, this is a, a remnant of the fact that I've already mentioned as well that the, um, the antipodal map has the property that the complex manifold that um, that X represents in complex structure I is the complex conjugate to the complex manifold of structure negative I. Um, another property is um, that um, this, uh, since the space came to you from the beginning as a product, it's very reasonable to assume that there are sections. Indeed, there are. Um, so every X in X determines a section. Um, let's call that section S small x. It goes from you know CP1 to Z. Um, uh, this is not a holomorphic section, it's a real section. Real. Um, so that means that um, the section, um, the value of the section at the point negative zeta is, um, is yeah, I'm just writing it. So the section at point negative zeta is like taking the section at point zeta and, and using this real structure on the total space. Um, and, um, and in fact, the normal bundle uh, to this section as X is isomorphic, is a very uh, easy bundle, just O1 to the power 2N, where, um, 2n is the is the complex dimension of the of the hyperkähler space. And okay, so from from any hyperkähler manifold, so one way to think of hyperkähler manifold is the way we've been thinking about it so far, which is a single space endowed with like a whole bunch of complex structures. But in different ways, is the sort of twister approach to it, which is it's a family of complex spaces. It's a family over P1. And it sort of has a bunch of like nice properties. And so uh, I've shown you how like to go from starting with a hyperkähler manifold in the usual sense to constructing this twister space. But in fact, these these sort of properties that I've sort of laid out for you here are enough to say if I have a space with these properties, it is in fact um, the twister space for a hyperkähler manifold. So. So let me just at least make that precise. So if you have oh, what's happening? Sorry, I think my pen is acting up. So given the space Z that has the properties, uh, you know, one through three, um, then from this space, I want to construct a hyperkähler manifold so that this space is its twister space. How do I do that? Well, I'm only using one, two, three. So the hint is something has to do with four. And in fact, uh, in four, I say every point of my hyperkähler manifold has does a certain thing, so the reconstruction should be um, that X should be the space of these things, and that's exact uh, exactly what's happening. 
So given a space with these properties, we let x be the space um, of all real holomorphic sections. Oh yeah, sorry, I of course misspoke earlier. So this 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 section is a holomorphic section, but it's, it's not just holomorphic, it's also a real section with respect to this real structure. So it's the space of all real holomorphic sections um, uh, that have normal bundle isomorphic to just um, you know the right number of copies of O1. Um, then um x is um canonically pseudo hyperkähler pseudo here is in the same sense as for like pseudo romanian metrics uh, so it means that it's hyperkähler except that i can't guarantee that the metric is positive definite it may have like indefinite signature so it's pseudo hyperkähler um, and moreover If um, Z is the twister space, of uh, some pseudo hyperkähler manifold X, then X prime, sorry, then X prime embeds instead of X. Um, as, as a pseudo hyperkähler space. So it's not quite quite what you would want, but it's close enough. So um, so X contains all of these sections that are described in point four, but it's hard to guarantee that like in general there may not be extra sections. So the sort of reconstruction may con may potentially create a larger space. I don't actually know much about this. I like most of this copied this from the lecture notes by Andy Neitsky. And he says that he's never heard of an example where these two spaces don't coincide, but it's hard to rule out. So, so let's at least give one example of this though. If in the easiest example where you just take quaternionic space, then this twister space is just O of one plus O of one sitting inside, sitting over a CP1. So it's the it's the total space. Okay, so so the so the reason why I'm why I'm doing this is so um, of course this modular space of Higgs bundles fits into this hyperkähler family, and for this hyperkähler family, um, you know, I again have a twister space, and you could naturally ask, does this family, does this you know twister space family have a modular meaning? Oh, it does. Twister space of um, uh, you know A H hyperkähler quotient by G F a modular meaning. So um, the answer will be yes, but let's. Um, Let's take a quick look at what, what, what we know. Quick look. So at, um, well, that's not how you do an at. At um, zeta equals one, we said we have you know flat connections or Einstein connections. So what's a connection? Um, a connection is, uh, has this property, right? If I take a section and multiply it by just an S infinity function, then it has this Leibniz property, del F times S plus F times nabla S. So a connection is not C infinity linear, right? It's not a tensor. It has this, this funny extra term here in the beginning, this Leibniz rule. Whereas at uh, zeta equals zero, um, phi, of f times s, right? This is just a one form. 
um, some one form. So this will just be f times phi of s. So as you can see, this sort of funky term that prohibits it from being, you know, just something tensorial is gone at the point zeta equals zero. So this um, this sort of inspires uh, the idea of thinking of this Higgs field as a deformation of these um, of these connections by um, at point one is just have a regular connection and they just rescale this term in the beginning to make it vanish at zero in just a regular deformation sense so and this is what's called a lambda connection which is coming from sort of the notation that I've been using is a little bit unfortunate because um, the lambda will literally be this parameter zeta um, this twister parameter zeta that I've been using but this is how people call it so I would just stick with lambda here as well so a lambda connection on this bundle C um, is a triple um, lambda del bar E and this thing that actually deserves to be a lambda connection nabla lambda where so the lambda is a complex number um, del bar E is as you would expect is a del bar operator so it turns um, the complex vector bundle uh, E into a holomorphic vector bundle and and this this guy nabla lambda um, is uh, a morphism from sections of e to zero one forms on e um, such that um, first and foremost it does what we thought it would um, this this Leibniz rule gets rescaled. So it's uh, lambda times del f tensor s. And I don't need to touch the second, uh, I need, don't need to touch the second piece. And secondly, um, well, when we talk about these like Einstein connections and all of that, they weren't just like arbitrary connections, right? They, since I already have this del bar operator, they interact with it in a way. So we we always, cared about connections that are compatible with a complex structure. Um, and for Higgs fields, that was the statement that Higgs fields should be holomorphic sections. So let's just, uh, let's just stick with that. So nabla lambda is compatible with the complex structure, the bar E. Okay, so, so these things are called lambda connections. And they again, these form a moduli space. Um, this usually, these things usually called the Hodge moduli space. Um, it it fibers over, you know, a one or C um, in the most naive way. Uh, a tuple. A uh, triple L bar D lambda lambda. I just record what the lambda was. Um, and you can check, or you, I think you can just believe me, really, that, um, sorry. Let's give this thing a name. Um, maybe call this pi. Pi inverse of zero is. Is the Hitchin moduli space or is the is the Higgs moduli space? So it's the one that I earlier called A1C mod out by GC. And pi inverse of one is M de Ram. So it's the one I called A2C mod out by GC. And so uh, it is it is also fair to just call it, it is the um, twister space um, restricted 
to you know just fly over sea. So it's the part of the twister space that lies over uh, just the complex uh, plane rather than all of CP1. Okay, so um, so this sort of gives another intuition into uh, I think it gives another intuition into the non abelian Hodge theorem. So it says that we have sort of you know real real speaking, so like forgetting about the complex structures, we have just a flat family of some you know some uh, manifold. Um, we're not so careful about stability conditions, or if we like only look at the stable locus, we have just a flat family. Um, of a single space times C, where we can endow this entire space with a complex structure that varies in the in the fibers, um, and over the point zero, that complex fiber, the complex manifold in this fiber, is the Moyer space of Higgs bundles. But as soon as we perturb it ever so slightly, we become we get the Moyer space of you know complex Einstein connections or the Moyer space of flat connections. So um, yeah, so. That is that, and then um, it's actually all I wanted to do for today. But I still have like two or three minutes. So let me also say that um, there is a C star action. What does it do? So zeta of this triple. Um, is just uh, zeta lambda del bar e zeta neb nebula lambda. So the C star action doesn't touch sort of the the, uh, the bundle part of it, but it does touch the connection of the Higgs field. So um, you can check that, you know, you can at least check that Zeta times nebula lambda is a zeta lambda connection. That should be pretty obvious because um, in the slackness rule, the, the 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 sort of C infinity linear part just has the same zeta on both sides, so that doesn't do much. But um, the first part where you pull out this funky lambda, now you also pull out a zeta, so that's fine. Um, so these um, you have the C star action and uh, on sort of on this whole Hodge Moyer space, it looks like this. But on on M Higgs, um, you can also think of this as since the lambda is already zero, um, it does all it does is it, it rescales the Higgs field. Um, okay, so in particular, this C star action, um, you want to look at its fixed points and those fixed points will lie in the Higgs bundle modular space. So under this C star action you could be interested in asking, you know, what are the Higgs points? Where where do points flow as I fall, you know, with zeta into zero? And you will fall into um, the modular space of Higgs bundles and you will fall in fact into a very um, interesting and specific part of it. Um, it's a part that lies inside of what's called the nil potent cone, which I will talk about more tomorrow. And um, and the the fixed points uh, have a name, and they're called uh, variations of mixed hot structures. And I guess the only reason I'm mentioning this right now is because there was a course on hot structures last week by uh, two folks at the University of Michigan. Maybe you attended it. Okay, cool. So I think that's all I wanted to do for today. So tomorrow we will uh, take a closer look again at the multiplex of Higgs bundles. I will show how it is, you know, a complex integral system. So I will play around with sort of abelian varieties, and I want to um, I want to see how much time I have to talk about uh, sort of the mirror symmetry program for like hypercalar manifolds or like Higgs bundles. Well, thanks for your attention. And uh, are there any questions? Uh so before you wrote down that definition of a lambda connection, uh, so you had that thing at zeta equals one for a connection. Um, so that looks that looks like a holomorph. That's a holomorphic connection, right? 
Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, so, so is the underlying bu the underlying bundle has to be flat for that to even exist, right? Uh, yes, you're right. Okay, yes, you're right. So, okay, excellent. Good, thanks. Yeah, so the stuff I'm talking about at the end, you're right. This is in uh, D equals zero degree zero. So in other words, okay. I'm not doing GLK case, I'm doing the SLK case. Thanks. So does this like, um, so like you can do this Higgs bundle stuff for other, for non-degree zero cases. So does this discussion not kind of break down in the, when you're not in degree zero? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't usually think about GLK case. Uh, so, I'm pretty sure that these, um, yeah, what can I say? Yeah, so this this mod, this mod modular meaning of the twister space, I'm only familiar with the SLK case now that I think about it. I have not seen someone do this for like the case of another, like even another sort of simple Lie group, let alone like a reductive algebraic group. I may just be ignorant to those developments. So I can't imagine someone has done that. So I would I would assume that at least in the um at least in the case of simple Lie groups, um that's like fairly straightforward um and sort of follows along the general lines of um how you jump from sort of principal bundles to vector bundles for like you know not SLN Lie groups. I'm not sure what exactly you would do in the case that um in the case of GLK. So you would certainly have to go from like, you know, flat bundles to Einstein bundles in some way. Um, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not like sure from the top of my head how you would do that. That's a good question. Uh, other questions? Okay, I will stop recording now and then uh, how do I do that?